So verse 5, she says, Sustain me with cakes of raisins. Refresh me with apples, for I am lovesick. Have you guys ever been lovesick? You ever been sick? Great interaction, guys. Great interaction. I'm assuming you've been sick before. You ever been sick of love? No. (laughs) There you go. Now, that's not what she's saying here, that she's sick of love. But in a sense, and I'm going to explain this to you and how this really goes, her describing that she's, she's lovesick, and I think, you know, sometimes maybe some of us can relate to this or be familiar with this, but this is really the, the thrill of this romantic love that she's going through with this man. You know, like there's a, a physical weakness, in a sense, uh, a disorientation, um, just because of her strong attraction to this man, this infatuation. There's a lot of feelings that get stirred up, right? Now, in essence, are feelings bad? No, they're not, right? Feelings, feelings are good. Like, God created us with feelings. God created us with emotion. But, but when can they become bad? Is when we rely on them, when we trust in them, right? Because, we, we, like, our feelings, our emotions, they're just constantly changing. And I think it's a good thing. I think, again, what God has given us to feel and to go through like, these are beautiful things that God has created us with. You know, I even think God has emotions, right? Like, he, he, he loves us. You know, he's not just a, a robot, you know? Um, now, with us, our emotions are tainted as well by, with sin, so we can't really ever trust them. But here she's describing, you know, these, these emotions, this infatuation that she has toward this, this man. And I totally can relate to this because, obviously, I pursued my wife at some point as a young man, and I remember just completely not ever wanting to be away from her. You know, there's always this, this um, beginning stage between a young man and a young woman that's it's really hard to separate them, right? And that's not a bad thing. It's, it's not a bad thing. Uh, but what we see here is something that, you know, typically over time can start to diminish, And what we actually find out is, according to a doctor, and I'm no doctor, you obviously know that, so I'm just going to relay what I found out. There's actually a brain hormone that, uh, that, that pushes this feeling of being in love or being infatuated, and it's one of these neurotransmitters, which is known as, I can't really pronounce it because it's such a huge word, (laughs) Uh, it's phenethylamine, I'll probably pronounce that really wrong, but it floods our brain when we fall in love. You know, it's that, that love sickness, that infatuation. There's actually really high quantities of it in chocolate. So be careful eating too much chocolate because <laughs> you might easily fall in love with someone. I don't know. Um, but it's a chemical that's associated with, um, uh, well, it's effects on people's moods. It affects people's moods and energy and is similar to those of various and other stimulants. Um, this is why people who are in love, they feel energized. They're upbeat. They're optimistic. There's a lot of dopamine. Um, you know, in, in a sense, like, they can stay up all night talking. Uh, you know, that's, that's just what happens chemically in our bodies, in our brain, right, when there's this, this love that is happening. And so this chemical, again, it gives us feelings of exhilaration, thrill, uh, well-being, and actual high amounts of it can lead to a loss of appetite, right? And so here she's saying, well, sustain me with, you know, these nasty cakes and apples for I'm lovesick, right? Like, I'm, I'm so infatuated with all these emotions and chemicals that are happening in my body and my brain, like, I, I, I can't even eat right now, right? And all she wants to do is she wants to be with this man. And so this chemical, it actually somewhat works in a cycle, right? It works in a cycle, at least especially in a relationship. At the beginning of a relationship, it spikes up, right? We see that. I think you, you maybe have gone through that. It spikes up, but after four or five years, it actually begins to decline. And ironically, across cultures, there's a spike in the rate of divorce at about four and a half years of marriage. (laughs) Ironically, right? And that's not to say, and I don't say that to say that we need this chemical reaction to sustain our marriages, right? That we need um, this to, you know, make sure that we don't, you know, become depressed or bored of each other or you know, lead to divorce, because ultimately what I truly believe is based on God's design for marriage and his instructions, that if we ultimately follow him, because he's, he's the sustainer of all things, 
right? He sustains everything. So through my ups and downs, as David says, you know, as he leads me to green pastures, but he's also with me in the valley of shadow of death. So no matter what I'm going through, my highs and my lows, right, whether that be circumstances or feelings, that God can always sustain me, right? And when I, when I abide in him and I do what he says, then these actual good feelings can actually continue on throughout my marriage, whether it be five years down the road, 10 years down the road, or 15 years down the road. It doesn't have to be a cycle, it doesn't have to be something that comes and goes, right? Because I think a lot of times, you know, we have a misconception of marriage that, you know, you just got to do your duty. You got to do your duty as a, as a husband. You got to do your duty as a wife. You know, it's really only fun in the beginning because that's when, you know, you're young and you're, you know, again, this love sickness, what's, what's passing through you, that's the best time of it. Well, no, that's not how God designed marriage. It wasn't supposed to be depleted from these things. It wasn't supposed to be boring and stagnant. It's supposed to be something that is good and refreshing and beautiful and joyous, and it truly can be. Right? I mean, what are we, 12 years in? Not that, not that far, but, I mean, it's, actually, that's older than Sarah. We got, right? You're only 11? Boom. Our marriage is older than Sarah. So it, it's, not, it's not as far as, you know, probably Brooks and, and Ricky's, but again, I can say, you know, 12 years in, like, it just gets better, right? And it gets better because, you know, you got to put in the work, obviously. You got to be intentional, but it doesn't get worse unless you're relying on something outside of Christ, right? Because he's, he's the sustainer of all things. And so here again, she's saying, sustain me with the cakes of raisins, refresh me with apples, for I'm lovesick, like, she just constantly wants to be, and I told you guys the stories of my wife and I and how, how we've, you know, we've made some stupid decisions because we didn't want to be apart. Did I ever tell you the story about when I worked at Subway? No? no? So I told you the story about the bike, right, where I tried to bike to church, and it was like 15 miles away. It didn't work, but I got a ride. So then another time, I was like, you know, part of, I, I think I want to lie to myself and say, like, I really just wanted to be at church but I think deep down I know it's because my wife was there, or my future wife. Um, so I got hired at Subway. I worked there Saturday and Sunday, and that was it. <laughs> so Sunday, they made me work on Sunday during church, and I was like, oh, heck no, like I'm not missing church. It happened to be a mile from the church, and I told my boss, second day of work, I was like, you know what, like, can I go to church? Because there was no customers. I was like, I'll just go there and I'll come back, like give me like two hours. So he was like, he was cool with it. I ran to church had church, saw Whitney, came back, went to work, and then quit the next day. Um, but I, like, I, I, I couldn't like be a, away from her. Like I, I, had to, I had to be close to her, right? And I think, you know, at a young age, we can be stupid, and we can make dumb choices. Like I, th- I think that was a pretty dumb choice at that point. Um, and so we have to be mindful of that we don't take these things so far where my infatuation and my lovesickness and, you know, my desire to be with her out trumps Christ, Right? Now, if it outtrumps other things, you know, so be it. But it can cause problems. It can cause problems, you know, especially when there's, when it hasn't been a marriage yet. It can cause problems with family. It can cause problems with work. It can cause problems with other relationships. You know, when I start to put, you know, my spouse or the, the one that I'm pursuing to be a spouse above everything else. And I think, you know, when we do premarital discipleship with young couples or actually any couple, we always tell them every lesson, because we go through six lessons, we tell them every lesson, look, no matter what, you have to put Christ first. Like his, your relationship with him is more important than your wife or your husband. And Jesus says this over and over again, right? It, he's like, you know, what does he say? He says in one, in one scripture, he tells us to hate our wife. You guys know that scripture? I can't remember what verse it is. It's somewhere in the gospels. You're probably thinking I'm crazy, but I'm not crazy because Je- Jesus said it. The point of it being, listen, the point of it being is, He wants us to love him so much to put him first in everything. That's it. That was like his point. And ironically, and it's not ironic because, again, he's the creator of all things and he knows the design and intention behind things, that when I put Christ first, I will be the best husband I can be, right? And she'll be the best wife she can be and I'll be the best, you know, insert whatever you want to be. You'll be the best version of that when we put Jesus Christ first, so she's lovesick. She longs to be in his present, you know, often and fully. 
she's enraptured just with being close to him. Um, but I think in a sense, she's getting a little bit ahead of herself, especially here in verse 6, where she says, his left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. And so, you know, she's, there's this romantic love that's happening. Um, there's this leading to this intimacy that can be a little too far. And it's starting to arouse something that we're going to see a theme of it within Scripture here in these next uh, seven chapters. We see it three times in verse 7 where it talks about don't stir up or awaken love until it pleases. And so I think, I think what's happening is it's leading to this point and this position, this extreme intimacy, which could certainly arouse or awaken sexual desire. And so she wants to be as close as humanly possible, Right here, you know, she says, his left hand under my head, his right hand embraces me. You know, these aren't bad things per se, but it's, it's leading to something that could be bad outside of the confines of marriage. Because again, I want to make sure we understand this clearly, that these desires between a man and a woman aren't bad. Would you agree? They're not bad. But we have to be really careful where they could take us, right? And this is where, you know, one of the fruits of the Spirit comes in, self-control, right? Because I, I remember, <laughs> it wasn't long ago, I think a young man, I, th- I found out a young man liked a girl. He was like 14. And I went up to him, I was like, dude, I'm, I'm so happy for you. Like at this point, as being a youth pastor, I'm like, dude, I'm just glad you like girls. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, it used to be like when I was in youth, it was like, stay away from girls. Now I'm like, dude, I'm just glad guys like girls and girls like guys. Like by all means, right? But still, with that, like, we still have to understand, you know, there's a way that God has designed this, this pursuit of marriage. And then the, what happens within marriage, right? So I, I think, again, these desires aren't bad. God has given them to us for a reason, right? But just like anything else, you can have good things and use them the wrong way or within the wrong context or within the way that we, we were told or designed to use them right? So even though this desire that she has to be really close and be intimate with him is not a bad thing, ultimately it can lead to a bad thing, especially if we're looking at their position right now of a man and a woman who aren't within the covenant of marriage, right? So they're not bad desires, but we have to be careful where they take us. First first Corinthians chapter 7 verses 8 through 9 says this, but I say to the unmarried, and this is Paul, He says, I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it's good for them if they remain even as I am. Paul was saying at this point he was single. He says, but if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Okay, what is Paul saying here? That if I have such a strong desire to be with the opposite sex that I should just go get married? Is that really what he's saying? Just like, that's, that's how you're going to, you know, stop this desire, just go get married and then do the deed and you're good? No, I, I, I really think a godly sexual relationship happens within the, co- the covenant or the confines of marriage, and that is where these needs are met, right? God has designed it a certain way, and it's not because we have these desires that we get married, but rather we get married and we do have these desires. Most people have these desires, right? But at the same time, I think we need to understand this, that if we do have a problem with lust or any type of sexual sin, that just because we get married doesn't mean that those things go away. Marriage is not the answer to that type of sin, right? It's not like all of a sudden, okay, now that I'm married, I no longer struggle with this sexual type of sin. No, really, who deals with with sin to begin with. It's God, right? So it's these things that we must bring to God, right? So Paul's not saying that we should only get married so we can have sex. What he's implying is, again, that most people have this desire. Again, it's not a bad desire, right? It's a matter of, okay, when this desire then starts to awaken, right? And he says, she she says, and then I, I start to do, you know, I give into it before it's pleasing or it's right. That's when it becomes bad. So most people have this desire, and this need should only be met within the confines of the marriage covenant, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. So she goes on to say in verse 7, I charge you, again, three times she says this. She says it in chapter 3, verse 5, as well as chapter 8, verse 4. 
the same exact thing. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the doers of the, fi- the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. So she's telling the daughters of Jerusalem here to remain pure, to not stir up love until the time is right. And so again, God has created man and woman to be together. Right? I mean, that was pretty obvious and intentional in the beginning of time we see in Genesis that man was to be with woman. And he's created this strong desire for us between a man and a woman, you know, to express our love, not just verbally, but also physically, right? Right. As of now, we've seen them expressing their love, you know, verbally. And here there's, they're wanting to take that even further and to express it physically. But again, as we're going to see, the way that God has designed things is that this expression of love should not be fulfilled until marriage. So we're going to see again this major theme of the book. Again, this, this um, it begins here by saying that sexual love must not be awakened at all costs until it pleases, again, which is only after marriage. And this sexual love completes the romantic bond. It's, it's the climax of it all. And so if it happens before the marriage commitment or the covenant, it leads to a loss of true romance, confusion, mistrust, honestly, awkwardness, sometimes it can be a loss of joy, and, and people don't want to admit to it, but it causes a lot of mess, a lot of mess, um, just like really any sin does. You know, there's always consequences to sin, obviously the consequences we have spiritually, but there's also consequences that we have here on earth. And, you know, I was talking to someone today, and they were telling me about their family tree, and I literally... <laughs> I could speak the same of mine, my family tree. Actually, let me just speak of my family tree. So I have nine siblings. I'm sure you didn't even know that. I have nine siblings, and they're all half-siblings. So we share either a mom or a dad. And out of the nine, there's two different moms and five different dads. Isn't that crazy? And did you know that I didn't know about like half of them until like seven years ago? And one of them is only like a couple years younger than me. And the rest are obviously younger than me. Um, but I say that because, you know, like there's consequences to our sin, and especially sexual sin, right? Like, we obviously know what sex leads to, like a baby, right? Or it can lead to a baby. And so here I am thinking of this, this family tree, and I'm like, man, you know, God specifically designed it to be a certain way. And when we go out of the confines of that, it just brings a a totality of just a mess, right? We have, you know, we have an influx of, you know, diseases. We have an absolute crazy amount of abortions here, not just in America, but around the world. Um, We have, you know, women who are raising, you know, kids themselves without fathers, you know, like it, it, it just brings hurt. It brings pain. It brings destruction, you know, all this because of our desire you know, to disobey how God has commanded something. And he's like, look, I, I know this is what you desire and what you want, and so I'm giving you a way to do it the right way. But what do we choose? What do we choose as humans? It's like we decide to reject what the creator has designed and say, no, I can do it a better way, right? And what we realize is when we try to do it our way, there's consequences to it. There's destruction, there's pain. And when we do it the right way, there's, there's blessing, you know, God truly blesses obedience. And so, um, again, it, it brings a lot of mess, brings a lot of confusion. And so prior to marriage, nothing should be done that stirs up or rouses this desire. And so this awakening of love, it, it could mean two things here. It could mean just having sex for the first time, or it could mean that nothing should be done physically to get the desire for sex going. And I know, you know, as I speak from experience with my own wife, my, I didn't, I've never, I think between us two, we've never dated anyone else. Is that right? Which I'm really thankful for because here we've gone into a marriage where, you know, we haven't had to deal with anything in regards to having been with other people, right? Whether that be, you know, romantically or some other way, you know, we can go in it fresh. You know, and obviously we have to deal with other issues because we're not free of, issues all around in life, 
but this specific issue is something that we've never had to to deal with and so you know we need to be careful of not even just putting ourselves in situations to get to the point of where we could awaken this love before it pleases now I know you guys have heard of abstinence. You've probably, you know, I don't know if you've had health class or your parents tell you or whatever, um, but in Scripture, it is spoken of and it's forbidden that we would have sex before marriage. Now, again, we got to look at the intent behind this, right? It's not a matter of, you know, Christians are a bunch of prudes and they don't want to have fun and, you know, like, well, Jeffrey, what if, you know, what if I just really love this guy? Like, because again, that's where our world's heading. It's like, if you're in love, that's all that matters, right? And I would beg to differ and say, you know, if you're in love, ultimately you're going to be obedient to the one who is love, right? And who has shown love. And if you do it his way, it'll be the best way. So in scripture, sex before marriage is forbidden. It's something that's immoral. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2, because I know I, I spoke with someone before this, and they, had, they were listening to a false prophet, and the false prophet, prophet was saying, nowhere in the Bible does it say that sex before marriage is, is forbidden. And now, you could say the same thing about a man not marrying a man, right? In a sense, like there's, sometimes there's specific things that scripture doesn't explicitly say. There's not like, you know, Romans chapter 25, verse 4, where Paul says, don't have sex before marriage, right? But what we see all throughout Scripture is sometimes we don't see the negative aspect of not doing something, but sometimes we see the positive aspect of doing something right. So I say it like this. Every time Jesus talks about marriage, he always talks about it, between, be, have it, be, it being between one man and one woman. Always. In every positive light, and every, every time he talks about it, it's in a positive light, about being between a man and between a woman. And every time we read about sex, it's always in the confines of marriage. That's how we read it in scripture. And every time that we read about immorality, it's about having, it's outside of the marriage, right? It's typically with adultery. So I think the Bible is pretty explicit and clear in that sense, that sex outside of marriage or before marriage is, is a, uh, is immoral. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I don't think I read it. Did I read it? Uh, verse 2, it says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. So in this verse, again, marriage is presented as the cure, in a sense, for sexual immorality because sexual union within marriage is commended and it's set against something that's immoral, which is to be avoided, right? So this means that any sex outside of marriage is considered immoral. And this would have to include, you know, sex before marriage. And even though it may be between two consenting adults who, you know, say they love each other and know that someday they're going to get married, you know, maybe they've even, uh, they're engaged, right? And they know that one day they're going to get married, I would even say then that it's not appropriate and it's not right and that it would be sin. It's only in the confines of marriage that Christ says that we can do these things. And again, there's, there's a, a good intention behind this, right? I mean, here, here's the creator of all things. Here's the creator of this ex exact thing. Like, he's the one that's designed this. He's the one that's designed the man, the woman. He's designed love. He's designed romance. He's designed desire. He's designed marriage. I, like, sometimes it's, it's funny to me that we would even question how he's designed things and thinking that, man, I could do it better. And then when we decide to do it better, we realize, no, that ended up pretty bad. I kind of see it like, <laughs> I couldn't think of a better analogy, but, but like Legos. You guys ever bought a box of Legos? Yeah, I know you have, so you don't have to answer that. I'm pretty sure like 99% of us have had a box of Legos and then you get the box, or even like a puzzle, for instance, I think Legos are better, but you get the box, and you see what it's supposed to look like, and then you open it up, and then you open up, and you see it's not exactly what the box said it was. What do you have to do? You have to build it, right? You got to put the time, you got to put the effort, but ultimately, you have to follow the instructions, 
right? So here's someone at Lego who's designed this thing, and he's given us explicit instructions. I love Lego instructions. They're amazing. Like literally a five-year-old can, can follow them. And so you follow that, and it, and it ends up being something that's beautiful, right? Something that it was intended to be. You put all these pieces together, but if you've ever tried to build it yourself, just using what's been given, sure, maybe you can come up with something decent, but it's not going to be as good. Obviously, this isn't a great analogy because there's no consequences to, you know, building your own Lego set from what the original Lego set was intended for, right? But obviously, we see in Scripture, you know, like, there are consequences we see in life, we see in experience. There's consequences, and there's things that happen when we don't abide by what God has, has told us to do. And so she's warning. She knows. She says, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. And I think, and again, I'm, I'm hopefully speaking to Christians, because anyone who is not a follower of Jesus would probably not like this, right? Because again, the way that the world is going, it's a matter of love to them. That it's, it's love which unites us. It's love that allows me to do whatever I want, right? But again, what we find out is sometimes this love is just an infatuation. It's, it's a chemical reaction. It's this feelings that come on. You know, like there's obviously that something happens between a man and a woman, but that can't be what sustains us. It can't be what drives us and gives us the confines of these things. No, it's not just love. It's love in the covenant that God has created, right? Yeah, there should always be love connected into, into this marriage, but it should be within the confines, again, of marriage. And so I think too often, you know, we try to get away with as much as possible before we call it sin. I think we justify too much. We justify too much. We see how far we can go, even when it's not actual sex. And I think at some point, too, that the Holy Spirit, and if you have the Holy Spirit, he will draw the line and, and tell you, you know, this is too much. You know, like, there is too much touching, right? There's, there's too much that's happening, even if it's just words where you're, you're stirring up this love before it should be awakened, Right? And I think Solomon was a good example of this here in chapter 1 and even a little bit of chapter 2, that he was very careful to tell her, yes, she was beautiful, right? But he doesn't speak of any of, like, sexual features. What were the things that he complimented? Cheeks, che like cheeks and eyes, right? And even some of the, the adornment and the jewelry that she was, she was wearing. Because I think, you know, obviously he has an attraction to her. I think it's an obvious thing. But when you start to open something up just a little bit and you open up the crack just a little bit, it allows for, you know, temptation in the flesh to, to, to give way and to just go into something full-blown. And so she charges them again, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. And well, when does it please? Well, again, when you're married. And then the door's wide open. And God allows, you know, God has allowed, how do I say this? He's allowed it to be good, right, and pleasurable. And it's for a good thing. It's, it's for something, again, that should be happening between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. And it, it's, it's bonding. It's good. It's, it's, it's building in the relationship. But there has to be no sin that's attached to it, right? And I think we've already put ourselves in a bad position when we start to awaken this, you know, before the time because then we've attached sin to it. And so the message for a Christian in seeking to be married is to avoid any activity that gets the mind focused or preoccupied with it. Any activity, thought, word, or experience which gets us excited toward this experience, it must not be indulged until the marriage night. Now, again, these things can be a good thing within marriage. But there's also thoughts, words, and experiences that can be bad things outside the marriage and within the marriage. And I would encourage you, you know, man and woman, you know, boy and girl, to not compromise in this area. To never justify anything. To never, under the guise of love, to say, yeah, I'm, I'm allowed to do this because there are consequences. And Scripture is clear that anything that arouses or awakens this, it can, be, it can lead to something bad. 
And so God has set forth a standard. He's provided principles, right? He's given instructions, and he's even warned us that if we do it God's way, you'll be blessed. You do it your way, and there's going to be problems. And just like any other situation, if you do it your way, there's going to be problems. If you do it God's way, well, again, you're going to be blessed. And when you do it God's way and you heed to his principles, you can have the best romance, the best honeymoon, and the best marriage ever imagined. There's consequences to us disobeying God. And again, he's the designer of it all. And who are we to say, no, God, it's, it's like my kids. <laughs> I tell them to do something, and they think they can do a better way, and I'm like, you know, just do it like I said. It'll be so much easier, so much better. And now with God, he's obviously way above my understanding because I'm not even the creator or designer of things. I've just experienced life a little bit longer than my own kids. And so who am I? Who, who me as the clay can say, you know, to, to the potter, who, how can I say anything? Paul, you know, Paul talks about this. How can I ever say, you know, my way is the best way? And so I think, you know, I've said this before, that if, if you don't believe this to be true, I mean, sure, you can try it. You can try to go against God's word, but you will see pretty quickly that there's going to be, you know, pretty harsh consequences to this.